Hello students, today we'll be discussing chapter 20 or the renal system and then this week we also have chapter 21 that talks about water and electrolyte balance which really ties into the renal system too. So here it goes. Um, first off, an overview of the system and the major part of the urinary system is made out of two kidneys, okay, and those are the actual organs that produce urine. Everything else after that are just pipe weight, pipes for the delivery of urine outside of the body. So you have bilateral ureters and a urinary bladder and then a urethra that, you know, will take the urine out of the body. But the actual organs that make the urine are the kidneys. Everything else are just pipes, pretty much. Um, it's really important to maintain the... Um, water and electrolyte balance in the body. It is also important to maintain a, um, the normal range of pH and body fluids. So it's really important the homeostasis of all of these different things. It also helps in removing some of some of the waste products, okay, even some of the drugs or their metabolites like different medications and um, as the body metabol uh, metabolizes them, the kidneys sometimes help in their excretion. So as I mentioned, we have the kidneys that make urine and then the ureters that will transport the urine from the kidney into the bladder. The urinary bladder is a storage for urine. It'll collect and store it until it fills up to a certain extent. And that's when we're, um, the, um, during urination, urine will pass through the urethra. So we'll talk a little bit about the kidneys. As we said, we have, they, they are bilateral, so we have a left and a right kidney. They, um, they look like bean-shaped little structures and they are found plastered to the posterior abdominal wall. They are found behind the peritoneum. So they are not inside of the peritoneal cavity like the intestines are. They are known as retroperitoneal organs, meaning that, again, they are found behind the peritoneal cavity. And if you don't, you don't remember what the peritoneum was, that was the serous membrane that surrounds the abdominal wall. It has its own capsule, so when you dissect a kidney and um, removing it out of the body, there is a whole capsule surrounding it and a lot of fat as well. There is what is known as a perirenal fat. Okay, so there's massive amount of adipose tissue surrounding it and connective tissue because it is kind of an important organ and it needs all of that protection. In the body, the left kidney is a little bit higher than the right kidney, okay? Um, and that does have some clinical significance, especially in males. Now for the kidney structure, um, when you look at the kidney, and I'm going to see if there is a picture for that. There we go. So we have the renal capsule on the outside, and then we have this bigger um, lateral surface. And then we have the medial surface where the hilum is. And again, the hilum of any organ is where things either enter or exit out of that organ. So you'll see here the ureter exiting out and you can see the renal artery and the renal veins. And there will be um, lymph nodes and nerve supply as well. The actual kidney um, structure is made out of the capsule. Underneath the capsule, there is a renal cortex and then deeper to the renal cortex, there is a renal medulla. The renal medulla is made out of this, these pyramids. And in between the pyramids, you'll find what are known as the, um, those renal columns. Okay. Renal columns are extensions of the cortex in between those renal pyramids. Then you can see here, this is... The renal cortex and the medulla, this is where the actual urine is made. And then when urine is made in here that it'll be dumped into what is known as a minor calyx. So we have to gather all of the urine that was made. It will start gathering it through these minor calyces and then minor, all of these minor calyces gather together to make a bigger major calyx. And then the urine passes through what is looks like a funnel shaped structure and that is known as the renal pelvis and then down the ure ureter to reach the urinary bladder. So I want to make sure I covered all of our different things. So, yes, we did. Okay, now for the structural unit of the kidney, 
that would be known as the nephron. The nephron is a microscopic structure. We cannot see it here in this picture, but we'll take a look at it and break it down to see how does that nephron work in order to make urine. So you can see here the different parts of the nephron. So you could, um, and those again are found part of it in the renal cortex and a, um, a portion of it in the renal medulla. So if you take kind of like a slice of that, you can see up here, that's the capsule on top. Underneath it, you'll find the renal cortex and then the renal medulla. You can find these different pipes and there's lots of blood vessels too. But we'll talk about the pipes first, okay? And then we'll kind of move on to the blood vessels. So you'll you'll have that, all, this whole structure is known as your nephron. Okay, it's made out of a renal corpuscle. Okay, that kind of looks like a little P with these little um, blood vessels or capillaries that are found on the inside. And then we have the, these um, wavy tubules. These are known as the proximal convoluted tubules. And then we have a loop. That loop is known as the loop of Henle or the nephron loop. It's made out of a descending limb and then an ascending limb. And then we have what the distal convoluted tubule. So again, your structure of the nephron, it's made out of your, um, this is the renal corpuscle. <clears throat> the renal corpuscle is made out of two different structures, the capsule on the outside and that little tuft of, of capillaries known as the glomerulus. The glomerulus is made by the breakdown of blood vessels. So a blood vessel goes into the capsule that is known as your afferent arteriole. It breaks down into this little tuft of capillaries and then it exits out of the capsule as an afferent arteriole. And then this afferent arteriole is going to start twisting around the remaining of these tubules and we'll talk about that um, as we go. But again, your different parts you know, following this, you have your proximal convoluted tubules, your nephron loop, the descending and then the ascending loop, and then the distal tubule or the distal convoluted tubule. And then you'll end up having a collecting duct. So we want to start collecting all of that urine into a collecting duct. And then these collecting ducts, as you can see here in the medulla, are going to dump the urine into the minor calyx. So the structure of your nephron, one more time, we have the renal corpuscle made out of the glomerulus, which is basically those that cluster of capillaries where you have the afferent entering into the glomerulus, um, you know, it, or entering into the capsule. It breaks up into a cluster of capillaries known as the glomerulus, and it exits as an efferent arteriole. And then that is surrounded by the Bowman's capsule or glomerular capsule that is going to receive anything filtered out of these capillaries. Okay, um, and then we have the renal tubules and that is those pipes that extend off of the glomerular capsule. So it'll, it'll give you your proximal tubule and then your nephron loop and then your distal tubule following by the collecting duct. Okay, the collecting duct uh, will um, be inside of the renal medulla and then dump the urine into the minor calyx. This is a closer look at the nephron or at the renal corpuscle in particular. You can see here that this is made out of a single layer. The, um, the glomerular capsule is made out of a single layer of these flat cells. And then again, you can see here the afferent arteriole that goes in it breaks up into a um, capillaries and then it exits as an afferent arterial. You can see that the capillaries are covered with these cells. These cells are known as podocytes. So po podocytes, site means cell, podo kind of, kind of comes from petal, Look, the meaning that they have these feet-like extensions or what it looks like, these finger-like extensions. And in between all of these um, podocytes, all of these um, you know, extensions, you can find little tiny pores, okay, what are known as slit pores. And if anything can 
um, fit through those pores, it will be filtered into this glomerular capsule. So as blood goes in to the glomerulus, there is a hydrostatic pressure. It goes in with a certain pressure um, and everything that, again, can fit through these little slits will be filtered in here. So you'll find the very first step of making urine is known as filtration, where it will filter you know, water and anything that can fit through those little tiny pores like amino acids, glucose, um, ions, and you know, different things that we'll talk about as we go. And again, that is your very first step. Another thing that I want to get your attention to is that the afferent arteriole is wider than the afferent arteriole. Okay, and that keeps the pressure inside of those these glomerular capillaries high in order to help infiltration. So the amount of blood going in is a um, lot more than the amount of blood exiting. And that again keeps the pressure inside of these capillaries high, high enough to, in this increases the hydrostatic pressure and it helps with the filtration process. And the kidney has the ability to change the width of these blood vessels so it can dilate or constrict them and that can lead to different changes of um, hydrostatic pressure in here and that could affect filtration. So now for the renal blood vessels, it has a huge, um, huge blood supply. Okay, so the renal artery that enters into the hilum of the kidney is going to start branching into these interlobal arteries and then the inner lobal will give you arcuate arteries, then down to cortical radiate. And then the afferent, and that's the one that enters um, into the nephron. That gives you the capillaries known as the glomerulus. It'll exit as your efferent. And then we'll give these peritubular capillaries that are going to be um, surrounding the rest of the tubules. And then we have to drain all of that blood through the cortical radiate vein, arcuate vein, inner lober, and then finally the renal vein. So we'll take a look at them, you know, here on this image. So first off, we start with a renal artery, okay? And that's going to be bringing in the oxygenated blood. And then the renal artery is going to branch into these smaller branches and where these branches um, are found in between the medullas or between these pyramids. And that is known as your interlobal artery. That interlobar artery is going to arch around the pyramid. And it, because of that arch, we call them the arcuate arteries. Now that arcuate artery will give out a little tiny branch that enters here, so that is your afferent artery, your glomerulus inside, and then it exits as the efferent artery or efferent arteriole, and then it'll wrap around the rest of the tubules, and those are known as your peritubular capillaries. That pretty much, you know, is going to use up all of the oxygen, so now we have to gather all of that deoxygenated blood, okay, and we'll do that by gathering the blood through these cortical veins, and then your arcuate veins, inner lobar veins, and then finally gather out as the renal vein. So the blood vessels of the nephrons, as I mentioned, you know, as we've discussed before, there is an afferent where the blood flow is going to enter into this glomerulus and then exits as an efferent arteriole. The afferent is usually um, brings in more blood, so the amount of blood entering is usually more than the amount of blood exiting, and that helps make sure that the hydrostatic pressure in here um, helps the filtration process. But again, we could change that up. So I'll give you a couple of scenarios and you try to figure out what would happen. So what would happen, in your opinion, if the efferent arteriole um, vasoconstricts? Okay, so the amount of blood coming in is still the same, but we have really narrowed the exit. So try to think, I'll give you a second or two, what would happen to the hydrostatic pressure in here? It would increase, and that would increase the filtration process. 
it will increase glomerular filtration, meaning that that person is going to be making more urine. Okay, well, another scenario, let's say that there is vasoconstriction of the afferent arteriole. So less blood is entering here. What do you think would happen to the hydrostatic pressure? Hydrostatic pressure would decrease in the glomerulus and that would decrease the glomerular filtration rate. So hopefully you're comfortable enough with these different scenarios. Um, if not, please let me know. Now for the sequence of the structures where, you know, the urine would have to pass and you want to make sure that you're comfortable with this. So first off, um, we have the different parts of the nephron and this is, you'll see here, this is where actually urine is being made. Okay, so we're going to filter a whole bunch of stuff and we're that filtrate um, is going to be modified a little bit. We'll add some things to it or, or we will reabsorb things from it that the body still needs. Um, as it passes through these different tubes. So first off, we have your renal corpuscle, and then there's your proximal convoluted tubule, there's the nephron loop, descending followed by the ascending limb, and then your distal tubule and then the collecting duct. When we bypass, when we're done, you know, beyond the collecting duct, this is just urine excretion, okay? We're not changing the composition of urine anymore. Um, these are basically tubes or ducts in order to eliminate urine. So the urine will be passing through minor calyx, then the major calyx, the renal pelvis, which is that funnel looking shaped structure down to the ureter. And all of these are your drainage system. Then it'll go to the urinary bladder for storage and then through the urethra for elimination or micturition. Now we have two different nephrons, okay? So the nephron that we just talked about, some of them are found, uh, most of them are actually found up here in the um, cortex, while others are found very close to the medulla, and we call those juxtamedullary nephrons. So juxta means neighboring. Um, so we'll talk about the cortical nephrons, okay? These are the ones that are found up here high in the renal cortex. And again, the majority of our nephrons are of those kinds. And those are the ones that, you know, are going to be making the majority of our urine. The juxtamedullary nephrons, the ones that are deeper in the cortex, very close to the medulla, these are the ones that are important in the regulation of water balance and they um, regulate the concentration of urine. So they are going to regulate whether the urine being produced, is it going to be diluted urine or will we concentrate the urine and keep that water in the body? Okay, so the majority again are cortical, while some of them are juxtamedullary. Um, the juxtamedullary ones are the ones that are more important in the water balance and regulating water balance and concentration of urine. This is kind of like a mold showing you the um, how dense the blood supply of the kidney is. Okay, you can find here that it has a very, very it's a very vascular organ. The juxtaglomerular apparatus. So we said that the juxtaglomerular nephrons are important for the homeostasis of water or the regulation of water and um, concentration of urine. In order to do so, it needs to have these receptors um, that can detect the osmolarity or the concentration of urine. And these receptors work together in an apparatus known as the juxtaglomerular apparatus. So I'll go down here to a picture. Okay, so this juxtaglomerular apparatus, you'll find here that the afferent arteriole and the um, ascending limb of the nephron, they are in directly touching each other. We have these juxtaglomerular cells surrounding the afferent arteriole, and you can also find these macula densa cells that are part of the ascending limb. These juxtaglomerular cells that are surrounding the um, afferent arteriole, those detect changes in blood pressure in this afferent arteriole. So as blood is going into the glomerulus, these macula densa um, sorry, these juxtaglomerular cells have 
baroreceptors that pick up changes in blood pressure, while the macula densa cells that are part of the ascending limb of the nephron are able to pick up changes in the osmolarity or the concentration of urine. So they have osmoceptors. Um, the, any changes in blood pressure, okay, is going to, when we stimulate these juxtaglomerular apparatus, that is going to lead to the secretion of renin. Renin is a hormone that is released by the kidney, and it, it is going to activate that renin angiotensinogen system that helps bring back the blood pressure back to normal. So we will activate this system if hypotension occurs. Now, a little clinical application. Um, we'll talk about glomerulonephritis, which translates into the inflammation of the glomeruli. Nephritis is inf inflammation of the kidneys, while glomerulonephritis would be inflammation of the glomeruli. It could be either acute glomerulonephritis or chronic in, uh, glomerulonephritis. So we'll kind of take an example of, e of each. In acute glomerulonephritis, um, that means that there is an acute attack on the glomeruli, and the most common cause is due to um, an immune reaction. And the scenario usually is that somebody gets strep throat. They do not take antibiotics for it. Okay, so the strep throat is caused by a beta hemolytic streptococcus um, bacteria. And if the patient doesn't take antibiotics for it, the body responds, or not in every, not all people, but in some individuals, their immune system makes an antibody that is unable to recognize their own glomeruli. So that antibody made against that bacteria is going to start attacking the person's own um, glomeruli in the kidney. So it's, it's considered um, an autoimmune disease where you have this antigen antibody complex that are going to attack the kidney tissues and lead to the destruction or an acute destruction or acute inflammation of the glomeruli. In chronic glomerulonephritis, this occurs over a longer period of time. It is a more progressive disease, and um, the kidneys or the glomeruli are, you know, progressively destroyed until the kidneys lose their function. They can, if somebody goes through, through this for a long period of time, they can lead to increase in fibrous tissue or scarring tissue in the nephrons leading to renal damage or and renal failure. Now we'll start off with the process of urine formation. So it's made in three different parts. The third process, first process is glomerular filtration, where we are going to filter plasma and anything or water and anything that could fit through those slits. Okay, and that happens inside of the um, Bowman's capsule. And then as we go through the proximal convoluted tubules, the, we go, move on to step number two, which is tubular reabsorption, where the kidney realizes that, you know what, there are things that I just filtered that I actually need, like glucose, amino acids. Um, I need to reabsorb those back into my body and then it moves on to the distal tubules where the majority of tubular secretion happens. And tubular secretion would be the secretion of some of the waste products. So again, the kidney realizes that there's still some metabolites in my body that I have to get rid of, so it'll secrete it into the urine. So we'll take a look at the first process, or we'll take a look, this shows you all three processes. First one happen that is going to occur would be glomerular filtration. And again, due to the high hydrostatic pressure here in the glomeruli, things are going to be filtered out. And that filtered fluid is now known as filtrate. As we move through the renal tubules, most of tubular reabsorption happens in the proximal tubules, where again, things that are important to the body, like glucose and amino acids and um, you know some ions, are going to be reabsorbed from the tubule into the capillaries. Well, things that are in the capillary that might be considered metabolic waste 
will be secreted. And tub most tubular secretion happens in the distal tubules. For example, if there is too much potassium or too many hydrogen ions, those could be secreted from the peritubular capillaries into the renal tubule. And then eventually, you know, whatever the end result of that filtrate is would be eventually eliminated as urine. Glomerular filtration, that again is your first step. It happens in the glomerulus where things that are going to be filtered out through, through these little slits that are, um, are also known as fenestrations. Anything that is small enough is going to be filtered, okay? So large, bigger molecules like large proteins, okay? Um, bigger cells like red blood cells, okay? Those are way too big, they cannot pass, they should not normally appear in urine, okay? Um, filtrate has the same composition as your tissue fluid. So again, which is basically plasma minus the bigger proteins. Here you can see the process of glomerular filtration, where again, blood coming in through the afferent arterial, it'll pass through these little capillaries. And because of these little fenestrations or the little tiny holes, anything that can fit through it will be filtered into that space that is known as Bowman's capsule. Okay. Now for the net filtration pressure. There are two different pressures that are acting against each other when it comes to filtration. Okay, so we have here the hydrostatic pressure trying to push things out of the capillary. Okay, but because there is fluid here in the capsule, this also has its own hydrostatic pressure, but it's usually less than the hydrostatic pressure that is found here. So the end of at the end of the day, the whole process is going to um, favor filtration out of the capillary. And so you have to, um, you know, go through these different forces in order to understand how this filtration process helps or occurs. So your net filtration process are your force forces, that one force actually that favors filtration minus the forces that oppose filtration. The force that helps filtration is the hydrostatic pressure inside of the glomerular capillary. The forces that oppose filtration would be the hydrostatic pressure in the capsule and the osmotic pressure found inside of the capillary too. So we can kind of go over here and don't really worry about these different numbers, but I just want to show you the three pressures that are in place here. Again, filtration, the one that helps filtration is the hydrostatic pressure here in the glomerulus, while the two that oppose filtration would be the hydrostatic pressure in the capsule and the osmotic pressure of the capillary. So the osmotic pressure in the capillary will try to pull in water back into the, into the capillary. But at the end of the day, um, you know, if you do the math, your net result is filtration. The glomerular filtration rate is directly proportionate to all of these net filtration pressures. Okay, you can see here that on average, we filter about 180 liters per day, but we only make half to about two and a half liters of urine per day. Okay, so the remaining of that 180 liters, we have to reabsorb all of that back through that process that we know we um, now know as tubular reabsorption. Okay, a blood plasma um, is filtered about 60 times per day, so our kidneys can filter our blood 60 times every day, and only a, a very small percentage, as you can see here, is going to be eliminated as urine. So how is it that the kidneys regulate filtration rates? There is the process of autoregulation. Um, so autoregulation would be by what, in order to, and this is where the afferent and the afferent arterial kind of come in. Okay, so you can change the diameters of the afferent or the afferent arterial to either increase or decrease the filtration rates, and that is known as autoregulation. There's also the renin angiotensin system. And then there's the, these two hormones, 
One of them is known as the atrial natriuretic peptide, and the other is known as the ventricular natriuretic peptides. These two hormones are going to, they're protein hormones, as you can see, and one of them is made by the atrium of the heart, and another is made by the ventricle. And these increase the excretion of sodium in urine, and the names tell you what they do. And when you increase the, uh, the excretion of sodium in urine, by osmosis, sodium is always going to be pulling water with it. We want to talk about the renin-angiotensin system. So angiotensinogen is a protein that is made by the liver, but it circulates in an inactive form as angiotensinogen in our plasma. When there's a decrease in blood flow uh, or decrease in blood pressure to the kidneys, that is when the juxtaglomerular apparatus is stimulated and it's the kidney makes renin. Renin is going to activate angiotensinogen into angiotensin 1. Angiotensin 1 is still not active. Okay, it has to be activated into angiotensin 2, and that is done by an enzyme known as ACE, or angiotensin-converting enzyme, which is found in the endothelium of the lung capillaries. Now, angiotensin 2 is the active form. Okay, so it'll produce these four different things in order to bring your blood pressure back to normal. It'll vasoconstrict the blood vessels. It'll increase aldosterone secretion. It'll increase antidiuretic hormone secretion, and it'll stimulate the thirst center in the hypothalamus, making the person thirsty and uh, increasing their water intake. Now, all of these four actions together eventually bring back the blood pressure back to normal. Now, moving on to glomerular um, tubular reabsorption, I just want to show you a couple of numbers. Again, you don't have to really worry about the exact um, numbers of these, but I, I have it here to show you a couple of things. So for example, glucose, okay, in our plasma, our glucose levels are about 100. Um, these again are just averages, 100 milligram percent. We filter all of it, but in normal individuals, there should no, not be any glucose in urine. So you see here that we have reabsorbed 100% of that glucose. So all of the glucose is filtered in the kidney, but it, all of it is going to be reabsorbed back. Okay, another, you know, an, an example here that you can see creatinine. We, you, this is your levels in plasma, and we are going to excrete it all or filter it all in the glomerular filtrate. But you see in urine, it has a high level of creatinine because the body is going to actively secrete every single last molecule of creatinine into the urine. It is a toxic metabolite that the body has to get rid of. So these should just show you, you know, these numbers are there to kind of illustrate the difference between something that the body needs that is going to be reabsorbed versus something that is toxic to the body and needs to be secreted into urine. So we'll talk about tubular reabsorption. The majority of tubular reabsorption happens in the proximal tubules. Okay, the um, what in tubular reabsorption means that important molecules like glucose and amino acid are going to be reabsorbed, and the movement is from the tubule into the peritubular capillaries, while secretion that mostly happens in the distal tubules is in the opposite direction, where um, secretion will be secretion of metabolites that are toxic to the body. Um, the body wants to get rid of it, so you will secrete them, and the direction of flow would be from the peritubular capillaries into the nephron. So a couple of, you know, a little bit more details, detail on tubular reabsorption. Some of them are um, reabsorbed through a process of active transport. Okay, for example, um, glucose and amino acids, okay, those have to be actively transported from the tubule into the peritubular capillaries. 
which means that we need a protein carrier. Okay, if you go back to what active transport was, it was using a transporter, using a carrier, and it needed energy, it needed ATP. The only thing though here is that we're kind of limited on the number of these carriers. So if somebody is diabetic, which means they have very high, higher than normal glucose levels, um, that is going to overwhelm these carrier proteins. They are going to be saturated, which means that eventually some of that glucose is going to leak into the urine and they would have glucosuria, which means glucose is going to spill into the urine. And um, so again, normal urine should not have glucose in it, but in diabetic patients, because of their higher than normal glucose levels um, and the overwhelming or the, um, you know, reaching the maximal capacity of these carrier proteins, glucose will eventually appear in urine. So these are actively transported glucose and amino acids. Um, water is going to follow by osmosis. And then the smaller proteins that were filtered out, those are going to be uh, returned back um, through a process of endocytosis. So here we're going to be talking about sodium and water reabsorption. Again, most of it happens in your proximal tubules and reabsorption is from the um, nephron into the peritubular capillaries and that happens by um, active transport. Water is going to follow by osmosis as we just you know discussed in the previous slide. The thing is that sodium is positively charged. So when it is actively transported, it has to pull with it a negatively charged ion. So it could pull with it either a chloride, phosphate, or bicarbonate, and all of these are negatively charged and they're going to just kind of tag along that positively charged sodium. Now for tubular secretion, which again, the majority of that occurs in the distal tubules, and this is where the kidney realizes that there are some waste products that I don't wanna keep in my system, so I'm going to secrete them from the tubular capillaries into the nephrons or into these tubules. For example, potassium and hydrogen ions. Sometimes even different drugs or medications that we're taking, those can be eliminated using that same process as well. Now for regulation of urine concentration and volume, there are different hormones that play into this. For example, aldosterone, and the cardiac natriuretic peptides that we talked about, so the atrial and the ventricular ones, these are going to regulate the um, concentration of ions, sodium in particular. Okay, the hormone that is responsible more for the amount of water loss is known as antidiuretic hormone or ADH. Okay, and they it produces its effect on the distal tubules and on the collecting ducts. So in the absence of ADH, when ADH is not there, the distal and the collecting ducts do not allow for the water to be reabsorbed. They are impermeable to water, okay? So in the absence of ADH, we are going to be making diluted urine. If ADH is present though, okay, that is going to allow the passage of water and this is how we concentrate the urine. So you can see here in this image, this is where there are no, there's no ADH in our system. And you can see here the, you know, the filtrate is just passing. There is no reabsorption of water and we end up making diluted urine. In the presence of high ADH levels, okay, so let's say for example, somebody is, um, running a marathon and they're not taking in enough water, so they are totally dehydrated. The last thing their body needs is to start making diluted urine. It would want to concentrate the urine and keep that water in the body. So your body will start making high levels of antidiuretic hormone. Again, it'll exert its effect on the distal and on the collecting tubules. And you see here that water now, these tubules are now permeable to water, allowing for the reabsorption of water and leading to the formation of concentrated urine. Now the counter current multiplier is the um, events that happen in the nephron loop. So we have a descending limb and an ascending limb. The descending limb, as you can see, it's much thinner 
and it allows it is permeable to water, but it does not it is not permeable to ions. OK, while the descending sorry, while the ascending limb. Um, is thicker, OK, and it is only permeable to ions like sodium and chloride, but it does not allow for the permeability of water. So they are very different in their structure. So one more time, your descending limb is thin. It is permeable to water, but not to, to salt. While the ascending limb is the exact opposite. It is a thicker limb and it allows for, it is permeable to salt, but not to water. And that is why it's known as the counter current multiplier because of the, you know, the different flow of fluid and um, their effect on how we change the osmolarity of urine. And so which we are going to be talking about in this next slide right here. Did I go in the wrong direction? I did. Okay. So first off, when we filter everything here, the filtrate in this, in the proximal tubule is an isotonic fluid. Okay, this isotonic fluid is going to enter the descending limb. And remember, again, the descending limb is permeable to water only. So now we're going to be concentrating that isotonic fluid into a hypertonic fluid. Now, this hypertonic fluid is going to enter the ascending limb, which is permeable to salt only. And that is why we're going to be reabsorbing all of that salt um, as it passes here, leading to a hypotonic fluid at the end. So you see how we're changing the tonicity of urine as it's passing through the different parts of the nephron. So again, in the proximal tubule, it, it ends up being isotonic. It enters the nephron as isotonic. And as it reaches the end of the descending limb, it becomes, it becomes hypertonic. And then that hypertonic fluid as it's ascending through the thick ascending limb, we are going to reabsorb all of those um, salts and end up eventually making hypotonic fluid. And then hypotonic fluid will enter into the distal and the collecting tubules. Now for the urea and uric acid formation. Urea is a byproduct of protein catabolism. So as we break down our little proteins, we end up making urea. Okay, it really reflects the amount of protein in urine, the higher protein intake, sorry, protein in diet, the higher protein intake, the higher urea um, formation or urea excretion. Sorry about that. I had to actually charge my laptop so I can finish up this chapter. So again, urea is a byproduct of protein catabolism. It'll enter um, the renal tubule through glomerular filtration. And then the body, you know, some of it is going to be reabsorbed. Some of it is going to be secreted. We end up actually reabsorbing about 80% of it. And the remaining 20% is going to be excreted in urine. So our body keeps 80% of that urea. Uric acid is a byproduct of nucleic acid metabolism. We're also going to be filtering that. We, um, just like urea, we reabsorb um, all of it, actually. 100% of it is going to be reabsorbed through active transport. But then we secrete about 10% of it through tubular secretion. So again, um, you know, in both of these, we keep some and we secrete some. Urine composition. So what does urine eventually look like? Well, whatever is the end product um, coming out of the collecting duct. OK, so it 95 percent of it is made out of water. And then we have the metabolic waste products like urea, uric acid and creatinine. And we might have some trace amounts of amino acids and different amounts of electrolytes, depending on the needs of the, the body. So your urine composition really is changes from day to day and time to time, depending on your dietary intake, physical activity, um, water intake, and lots of different other factors, temper, you know, the um, atmospheric temperature and so on. So on average, we make about half a liter to two and a half liters of urine per day. Um, each urine output would be about 50 to 60 milliliters um, of urine per hour. That is normal rate. But again, the amount, the volume of urine really depends a lot on the fluid intake and other environmental factors. 
Renal clearance means that if you are given something into your bloodstream, how, wh what is the percentage of it? What percentage of it would even actually be removed from the plasma by your kidney? So renal clearance is the rate at which a chemical is removed from the plasma by the kidneys. It is an indication of kidney efficiency. It could also help us in determining glomerular damage and the progression of renal disease. So as renal clearance changes, it can tell us is if that renal disease is worsening or improving. And we've got different renal clearance tests to perform. There's inulin clearance tests, and we get that from a plant root or creatinine clearance test. Um, but the problem with these two tests that they are filtered by the glomerulus, okay, um, but neither of them are reabsorbed or secreted, okay? So we are basically kind of, when you're looking at this, it's basically giving you an idea about glomerular filtration without looking, without taking into consideration reabsorption and secretion. Now for the ureters, those are your tubular organs. They're made out of smooth muscles. Uh, we'll talk about the different layers as we get there um, that are going to take the urine from the kidneys and dump it into the urinary bladder. They start off as that funnel-shaped renal pelvis, and they join the urinary bladder in the back, okay? So the posterior portion of the urinary bladder. The ureter has three different layers. There's an inner mucus coat made out of transitional epithelium. There is a middle muscular coat made out of smooth muscle, and then an outer fibrous coat made out of fibrous connective tissue. The ureter does have these peristaltic waves in order to transport urine um, down the ureter, down into the urinary bladder. These peristaltic waves, though, are, um, if there's any kind of obstruction, like due to a kidney stone, or renal calculus, so renal calculus is just a fancier term for kidney stone, that could trigger what is known as a urethrorenal reflex, where we have these very strong peristaltic waves in the obstructed ureter to try to move the stone downwards into the urinary bladder. When that occurs, if there is an obstruction in one of the ureters, that is also going to decrease the amount of urine being produced by that kidney on that same side. So kidney stones can be either made out of uric acid, calcium oxalate, calcium phosphate, or magnesium phosphate. They usually form in the collecting ducts or in the renal pelvis. They could lead to um, hematuria, which is blood in urine. They lead to very severe uh, attacks of pain, nausea, and vomiting. Most of the kidney stones pass on their own. Okay? Sometimes we would have to shatter them into smaller parts through what is known as lithotripsy. Um, and then we, when if they're too big, you can kind of shatter them into smaller parts, and then those smaller parts will be eliminated. If they're too big where you cannot do that, they could be surgically removed. The t kidney stones tend to kind of run in families, especially the calcium stone kind. And um, causes of kidney stones would be calcium supplements, okay, especially if the this is something that runs in families, or excessive intake of vitamin D, or urinary tract infection and urinary tract blockage. Those can lead to kidney stones. So if somebody has recurrent UTIs that leads to scarring and fibrous tissue, that could lead to um, UT blockage and then eventually lead to the formation of kidney stones. Now the urinary bladder, that is the hollow organ. Okay, it's a um, highly muscular organ found in the pelvic cavity. It is right behind the symphysis pubis and it is underneath the parietal peritoneum. So again, the urinary bladder is not a peritoneal organ. It is underneath the peritoneum. It's considered there to store urine, okay? And it, is there a picture on here? There is, okay, perfect. So in, this is right here in the female. You could see that this is the urinary bladder and it is found inferior to the uterus. And that is why in pregnant women, there's, the uterus is going to compress the urinary bladder and there is what is known as increased frequency of urination because of the compression. Okay. In males, um, you could see here that it is find, found again behind the symphysis pubis and these are the two ure ureters that are entering from the back 
onto the back of the urinary bladder. And you can see here the, the uh, seminal vesicles and the prostate underneath the urinary bladder. For the, for the wall on the inside, I think there's a picture that'll show that and we'll get to that in a minute. But the four different layers of the bladder, there's an inner mucus layer made out of transitional epithelium. And if you guys remember that chapter about epithelium, we taught, we kind of nicknamed transitional epithelium, we nicknamed it uroepithelium. You see here that is pretty much found in several parts of the urinary system. And then we have a submucous coat and then a muscular coat made out of smooth muscles, and then the outer serous coat, which is only the upper surface made by that parietal peritoneum. Okay, the smooth muscle fibers um, are what are known as the detrusor muscle, and the detrusor muscle, when it contracts, it leads to emptying of the bladder. And then we have two sphincters. There's an internal and an external sphincter. The internal sphincter is smooth muscle. It is involuntary. We cannot control that one. It's the external sphincter that we do have control over that is made out of skeletal muscle fibers. And as kids, you know, when you want um, a kid to start, um, when you potty train a kid, you're training them to control the external urethral sphincter. So this is a look at the urinary bladder from the inside. And you can see here the openings of the um, ureters all around the body, we actually can't see them, but you see that the ureters are going to open in the back, okay, these right here are your two openings right here, and then you have the opening of the urethra, and that kind of triangle is known as your trigone. Um, this is a male bladder because you see here a prostate that is surrounding the urethra. This is a posterior surface or posterior, um, an image of the posterior side of the urinary bladder in a male as well because here you can see the two seminal vesicles and the prostate as well. Now for the urethra, that's your tubular organ that will carry the urine from the bladder to the outside world. It's lined by a mucous membrane. It has many glands known as urethral glands, and it helps in um, lubrication. Okay, in females, the urethra is shorter than it is in males, and that's why females are more prone to urinary tract infections. Okay, the external urethral orifice is found just anterior to the vaginal opening. In males, um, it has a dual function, both for urination and for reproduction. The male urethra has three different parts. There's the prostatic urethra, which is the part of the urethra surrounded by the prostate. And then there's a membranous urethra, and then a spongy urethra. And the spongy urethra ends, um, at the very tip of it, you'll find the external urethral orifice. Here you can see the difference between um, a female urethra and a male. So again, um, female urethra is, short, is shorter, and hence the increase of UTIs in, um, in females. In a male, you find the prostatic urethra surrounded by the prostate, and then you have your um, the membranous urethra surrounded by the external urethral sphincter and the bulbo-urethral glands, and then you have the uh, spongy urethra surrounded by the erectile tissue. So what are your major events of micturition? So micturition, you want to be familiar with that term. It is just a fancier term for urination. That when the bladder distends and becomes full of water, oh, sorry, full, full of urine, that is going to lead to the stimulation of the stretch receptors. That'll send signals to the micturition center that's found in the sac sacral spinal cord. So the process of urination really doesn't, um, the center of it is not in the brain. The center is found in the sacral spinal cord. Okay. This will send parasympathetic fibers or parasympathetic impulses to the detrusor muscle to contract. Um, that means now you're going to feel the urge to urinate. Okay, the, it, but we're not emptying the bladder at this point. In order to empty the bladder, you have to voluntarily relax the external urethral sphincter in order to let the urine come out. When you're in an unsuitable condition, so basically you're not in the bathroom, okay? You are going to voluntarily contract the external urethral sphincter to prevent the 
passage of urine. But under suitable conditions, so when we are in the bathroom, now we can voluntarily relax the external urethral sphincter, and that together with the contraction of the detrusor muscle and the relaxation of the internal sphincter, that is going to lead to the elimination of urine. The bladder can hold up to about 600 milliliters, but we feel the urge to urinate when it gets to about 150. So little clues that we can get when we do a urine analysis. Okay, so we could check for different diseases, some disorders, even check, check for, check for um, drug abuse. Um, for example, it, uh, you know, the presence of glucose. So it could be a patient that is diabetic, okay, or maybe, you know, somebody that is taking medication for diabetes, but glucose is still being found in urine. That means that it's an uncontrolled um, diabetic, diabetic patient. Okay, we could change, we could take a look even at the different color of urine. Um, we can take a look at the presence of different cells, like if they're white blood cells, that might mean there's an infection. Um, Beturia, that's a different um, color of urine, it's much darker. There's, um, it turns a little bit pink after eating beets, which is actually a genetic disorder. Sometimes, even the change in odor. Um, due to the um, increased intake of asparagus that can lead to in, um, a very smelly urine. So what are the lifespan changes that can happen to the urinary system? Okay, well, just like any part of the body, tends, things tend to slow down. Okay, so at about age of 80, the kidney loses about a third of its mass. Um, so about a third of its function, it is going to slow down and decrease the glomerular filtration rate to about a half by the age of 75. We can start developing proteinuria, so some protein can now be able to um, be detected in urine. There will be less efficiency in the reabsorption of nutrients and ions. It, the blood flow to the kidneys could be slower, either due to atherosclerosis or diabetes, diabetic changes. The bladder ureters and the urethra lose the, their elasticity. The bladder is unable to hold as much urine, so you'll find um, one of a, you know, a very common um, symptom by, by seniors would be the frequent, um, that they, the increased frequency of urination, okay? If increase the frequency to the, or the urge to urinate. The kidneys also lose the ability to activate vitamin D and incontinence might also be an issue. And this concludes this chapter.